Gone? I know, that's the most stereotypical thing to say. <laughs> Excuse me a second. Okay. Just coffee. Just coffee, nothing else. I had a good friend. Well, wasn't a relative actually, friend of the family, good, good Christian man from my dad's hometown who went to Ireland and he came back saying, that Irish coffee is so good. He didn't know. <laughs> Dr. Vincent, he's, he's a good man, he's a family doctor for many years. Good Christian brother. How's everybody? I wasn't sure you came on Sunday morning. <laughs> You've been buried back in the buried back in the classes for so long, and that is very much appreciated. I'm glad you're getting rotated out, or did you get kicked out? Permanently replaced. They got kicked out. No, that's that's good. You, you need. People need relief. Okay, it is hot to me. A little warm back here. Good morning, everybody. Well, let's pray before we get started. Father, thank you for the beautiful day that you've blessed us with. We thank you that the weather's been a little cooler. And we pray that you will give relief to the people in California who are facing such terrible uh, such a terrible summer with the fires and the heat. Father, please help us to learn from your word. Help us to learn better who your son is and help us to model our lives after him. Forgive our sins, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. It is an amazing thing about living in Texas that you can have a cold front that lowers the temperature to the 90s and everyone goes around talking about, man, isn't this great? <laughs> isn't it great? <laughs> that's, that's just, that's what the summer's been like. Looking this morning at the calling of the first, calling of the first disciples, the, the chronology of how Jesus called the apostles is not always totally clear. If you look at John especially, there seems to have been some earlier contact with Andrew and Peter, and there, it's, it's, it's just a little hard to be sure sometimes how much contact there was, whether Jesus interacted with them at some earlier point, and then the point comes that he comes and says, okay, now follow me, that you know, we're ready. A uh, little bit hard to, to work these out, and the passages that we have here, <laughs> I'm still not completely sure about, but they do fit together to study. Matthew and Mark tell us of an occasion where Jesus is passing along the Sea of Galilee, saw the brothers Simon and Andrew casting a net in the sea. Now, the passage in Luke that, there's a reason I think that this is talking about the same occasion, although it's, it's possible that it's not. But at the beginning, it's a little hard to figure, a little hard to figure out. Luke talks about the crowd pressing in on Jesus to hear the word, standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and sees two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And of course, the difficulty there is, well, did he come up and they were fishing, or did he come up and they were Finished fishing. Well, you know, you could, you could go either way with that. Maybe they were fishing as he came up and then they finished while he was talking to the people. Um, if you're, someone drives up to you while you're getting ready, packing up your stuff and leaving, getting ready to leave the lake and they say, what are you doing? You say, well, we're fishing. You're still fishing, I guess. You're just in the, the downside of it. Luke gives this extended passage and just jump forward and the reason that I 
uh, the reason I think there's still reason to think this is talking about the same occasion is the very parallel statements here, follow me, I will make you fishers of men, or you will be catching men, and the statements that they left their nets, they left everything, Luke says, and followed him. But backing up here, this is this fascinating passage in Luke. Getting into one of the boats, he puts out from land, sat down, taught the people, and as he finishes, he says, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon, of course, tells him that they, the reason they were, <laughs> the reason they were wrapping things up was because there hadn't been any luck. And then, of course, there is. In verse 8, Simon Peter's reaction to seeing this is so wonderful. We look at Peter sometimes and it's easy to criticize him. It's also easy to criticize Peter because we know more about him. We don't know all the knuckleheaded things the others did. And we don't think about the knuckleheaded things that we do. I, I think Peter's, Peter's foibles are given to remind us that, yeah, you're all pretty much like this, people. <laughs> you're all pretty much like this. And yet, Jesus, wanted, Jesus loved him and wanted to work with him. But this shows a heart of somebody that Jesus can use. And he says that he will make them fishers of men, and they leave their nets. And then James and John, with their father Zebedee, who apparently, who are partners with Simon and Andrew in some fashion, and uh, Mark lets us know that Zebedee had hired servants too. So this is a, these aren't, uh, these aren't, of course, these aren't just uh, people out fishing for fun, you know. Um, this is not recreational fishing. These are commercial fishermen. And think of the, <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it ceases to be fun when your livelihood is based on it, right? <laughs> these, are, these are men who are in it for, for the business, and it's a, it's a, it was a big business, and Capernaum apparently was a big town for that. Interesting old picture. This is 1928 at Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, just down the coast a ways from Capernaum, and people using very similar boats to the... There was a boat found buried in the mud next to Galilee that, go, that dates back to the first century. I think this was maybe 10 years ago or so, or maybe more than that. There was a boat found there from dating back to the first century. Looks just about identical to these kinds of boats. They just had a kind of basic design that, uh, it's like the C-130 Galaxy, the C-130 Hercules, you know, it just goes on forever, it works. Uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John may have bigger boats than that, uh, I don't know if you could get all 12 apostles <laughs> into one of those, but they, they, they were slightly larger versions of that. I think the one from the first century was a little bit longer than that, but pretty basic little boats. And a little further up there, you see men up on the, men up on the shore with their, uh, pulling their nets out and working over their gear to uh, either finish up or get ready to start the day. I can't tell. So looking at the people that Jesus called, what kind of men did Jesus call for his apostles? Normal, everyday Pretty everyday people, yeah, I would certainly say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Simon the Zealot. <laughs> Simon the Zealot is the one that if, and I don't mean this in any irreverent fashion, of course, but if you were casting, if you were casting this as a some kind of adventure or espionage story for TV, Simon the Zealot's the one you'd put into the crew there. That he's the one you better keep an eye on, see which side he goes to, and all that. You don't really know where he's going to come down. Fisherman, a zealot, a terrorist. The authorities would have called him. Um, what else we have? Tax collector later on. Not part of the original, 
bunch of apostles. But uh, yeah, thinking of the thinking of the original twelve, and we'd go ahead and put Paul in there too. Now, Paul, you have the rising star, you know, of uh, Jewish scholarship. But for the most part, that's not that's not who these people were. How were they described by in the book of Acts? How are these how are these men described by the authorities? Ignorant. Ignor yeah, <laughs> that's. <laughs> I'd have to look at the etymology of that to see exactly what they meant by that, because ignorant, you know, ignorant is one thing. In one sense, being ignorant is no shame. Everybody's ignorant about something. Will Rogers said that. We are all ignorant just about different things. But, and Will Rogers is always quote worthy, right? Always quote worthy, most of the time. But, uh, yeah, they were unlearned men, according to the authorities. They saw nothing in these people that was remarkable. They didn't really expect people from Galilee to be all that much. They were from, if they had been flying, they would have called it flyover country. It was, it was farming, it was farming country. Wasn't where, wasn't where the uh, leadership of the country came from. Of course, you think about it too, Moses. Where was Moses when God called him? In ex in, uh, an exiled former political agitator <laughs> and uh, on the run, perhaps, might look at it that way. He was tending, tending herds when God called him. And also a, yeah, also a murderer. Of course, as the old Southern defense uh, goes, he needed killing. Some, sometimes they need. Sometimes they need needed killing. That would have been his defense. That could be a legitimate defense. Sometimes, uh, Elisha was. What was Elisha doing? That's. He was out plowing the field, <laughs> yeah, like Cincinnatus. You know, the Roman general who was called from plowing his field, and then um, after the the emergency was over there, I don't. That was during the Roman Republic, and after that was over, then he went back to his farm. That's why George Washington was referred to in that, that's where we got Cincinnati, Ohio, I think, was comparison of George Washington to Cincinnati, that he was a man who took up, left his farm, took up authority to get the country through the crisis, and then went back, gave it up and went back. Uh, Elisha was a man who just came off the farm. What was Gideon doing? <laughs> he was hiding, right? He was trying to farm and hiding at the same time. So God often called people with, uh, God often called some of his greatest people from pretty common walks of life. You'd look at these men as, as small businessmen. Love the small businessman. Um, the, uh, you know, these were working, these were working men. They, they had to, they had to make a, had to make a living, had to meet a payroll. They had servants and had to take look after. They didn't have any special training, apparently. The Jewish authorities said uneducated common men. Of course, they would have, any Jewish man would have some degree of education if he was brought up, you know, if he was brought up well at all he would have some education in the law. He would have his religious education. He'd be, he would get a certain amount of schooling in the law. And we think about that, think about that today, there are a lot of really, there are a lot of really good Bible teachers I've known who didn't have more than a high school education. There's some good Bible teachers I've known that didn't have more than a seventh grade education. But, you know, of course, seventh grade education used to get you further <laughs> than it does today, maybe. But uh, if you have... So you're saying Kevin Carroll is in the modeling? <laughs> he's got some doctor's degree and can teach pretty good? Would, uh, I'd, I'd probably rather just let his, his 
family speak to his anomalous nature. <laughs> but what I am saying is that a person who really knows the Bible well has an education in itself. You really know the Bible well. To start with, you know God's will, which is the most important thing to know. If you know the Bible well, you've had a pretty good education in poetry and literature and history. <laughs> if you know the background of things happening in the Bible, you've learned a lot of history along the way, too. You've got a lot of, of things there. So, but. No, oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And you have to, you're looking at who it came from, looking at who was speaking, the Jewish leadership considered them pretty uh, unqualified to be making the kind of statements they were. And he's yelling at you at the time. That so, reminds so me. The point I'm trying go ahead. to make is, is we can go through their schools and do what they do to be deemed highly educated, but yet when you stand behind the Word of God, I tell you, these lessons Sunday night where he just dissected virtue, virtue to stand with courage on moral issues with God. Y'all been there? Mm -hmm. It's a great lesson. And uh, sometimes we got to do that. But you're correct in that things don't change, do they? But oh, sure. You're a doctor. Kevin is not. I mean, you guys have a lot of education. And, and, um, you, but when you were talking about you get a good education from knowing the Bible, I think you glean wisdom that you don't. Sure. <laughs> well, right? yeah. Oh, sure. And education's a, a back to the Will Rogers statement of everyone being ignorant in different areas. I am so ignorant about the stuff that Kevin does at his work. I am so ignorant about that stuff. That's not right. He's ignorant about yours. <laughs> but, yeah, it's so the fact somebody has a doctorate, number one, what's it in? <laughs> you know? That doesn't make you qualified to speak with authority on every subject. <laughs> and the person who's, and, and a, a person with a doctorate ought to know that and ought to know their limits, too. That's, that's a matter, that gets to a matter of character as to how a person starts acting about that. And, well, there's still one of us here who has this section of life ahead there. Uh, don't get your education for other people's sake. Get it for, get it for 
what you need it for, what you want it for, right? <laughs> Don't get the education to try to convince people of the world. <laughs> Oh, on a lot of things, yeah. I have a real good friend. I have a real good friend who's got a, uh, at work, who's got a doctorate in theology. Nice man. I appreciate a lot of things about him. He's a good person to work with. But, yeah, he's, he's about just liberal as he can be about the Bible. Good person, but he's just out there. Well, sure. And, yeah, and you could, you can study theology today without, believing in God, which is an interesting <laughs> kind of thing to think about in itself. Uh, something about Peter, something about Peter is being, and, and probably true of a lot of them, and perhaps a feature of the kind of men that Jesus sought was people that were willing to learn. When Jesus tells him, now I want you to go out and cast your net again, and Peter even says, you know, we just finished doing that, but Okay, you say, go throw your net out, I'll throw my net out. Peter was willing to listen, and that's a, that's a big part of it. Jerry Clower, any, any Jerry Clower fans? Did I just, I just outed myself? Okay. Jerry Clower, even more Louisiana, no, he's from Mississippi, right? Yazoo City, Mississippi. Yazoo City, Mississippi. Mississippi, yeah. Would make Guy Elliott sound like a city slicker. Okay. At least, that, actually, Guy Elliott probably knew Jerry Clower. Um, very, very funny comedian. Uh, Jerry Clower talked about a man being educated far beyond his intelligence. And that's, that's when you get to the place that you're not willing to have your eyes open and learn. What, what's that guy's name? Jerry Clower. Oh, he's very, very funny. Very funny individual. I grew up with his comedy albums. Good, good clean comedy. Corny as it can be. Corny as it can be, but uh, some gems of truth there. And he was a very upstanding man morally, apparently, and took a really strong stand against racism in a time before it was, <laughs> when he was taking some risk at that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's sort of interesting that, it, it, that Kevin was describing the, uh, uh, the discussion you know, that he had with this individual on uh, homosexuality. That, uh, sometimes people get educated to the point that they don't really listen and try mm -hmm. to understand what you're trying to say and communicate because they know everything. And it's very hard to teach someone that's a, everything. That's a dangerous person. That wasn't the one I was thinking of. So, <laughs> That's a good so, one. So yeah. at the heart of wisdom is knowing that you need wisdom and that you don't know everything. And it's that, that constant humility to understand that there's a world of knowledge out there that comes from God that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's your uh, duty in life to pursue that. And that, that is true wisdom, is pursuing wisdom. And, mm -hmm. and
Hadn't that always been the t- case? Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> they want to present themselves as, as knowing more about, uh, about the world and the, and the choices we ought to make. Mm-hmm. It, I, I've just noticed that more and more lately. And look at their own lives, and their own lives are often a mess. So that's a, yeah, that's a caution too. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's always been the case. Now, I'm obviously not bashing education. That'd be kind of, I'd be a funny person to be doing that. I've been in and around colleges since I was 17. Yeah, I've either been in college, teaching college, working, working in a college since I was 17. So. <laughs> Be a funny person to be bashing higher education. Done other than some of that time I was working as a janitor to put myself through grad school too. So <laughs> it's not like I've never done anything else. But uh, you just gotta you just gotta see it for what it is. It's it's human wisdom and it's relative. I mean, even within okay, within the fields that I've studied in in higher education, musicology. I'm not respected in that field. I'm not respected in that field. I've never published. I went to UNT, which is not terrible, but not top flight, far from Ivy League. UNT, if you're in jazz, then yeah, you're big time. Musicology, medieval renaissance musicology, respectable at best. I wasn't one of the star students. I didn't publish. I wasn't a big wheel there. That's fine. And then I went completely, I went completely nuts and got out of teaching and became a librarian. Library degree also from UNT. Respectable. There's many more top flight schools. um, And I'll never be famous in that. So, well, (laughs) we all are. So uh, just say that, you know, the value of degrees is relative even within that world it's relative and uh yeah i got looked on as a as a hick when i was in grad school too by some people (laughs) got a little persecution for that being an unrepentant unrepentant oklahoman from uh with uh, missouri ozarks roots on the other side um there's an important number of important passages. Think about that. Well, yeah, another thing about the apostles, they were willing to give it up. They were willing to give up a relatively okay life. I don't know what the prospects were for zealots, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, commercial fishing, hey, it was a living. You could do that. It was certainly safer than following a guy who ended up being crucified. What Paul said. 1 Corinthians, consider your calling. Not many wise according to worldly standards, not many powerful, not many were noble birth. And that's Paul who at least, at least talking the equivalent of a PhD in his education, maybe more, maybe more. And the point that Paul is showing there is God does these things in the last phrase so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. What is, take the smartest person in the world. I was watching a program about Albert Einstein last night. Interesting, very interesting program about Albert Einstein. What's Albert Einstein compared to God? You know, we still, we still talk about Einstein, you know, say, hey, Einstein, you know, <laughs> making fun of somebody, <laughs> but not being, doing something not very smart. What's Albert Einstein's wisdom compared to God? He's not any smarter than any of the rest of us compared to God. So God doesn't need to use the best and the brightest as the world sees it. In fact, just point out before going further there, the best and the brightest were the ones who crucified him. The highly educated people and the people from the right families and the people who went to the right schools were the ones who turned against Christ and crucified him. And I'm not saying that to run down education either, but it obviously doesn't prevent you from doing terrible things. There again, 
goes back to wisdom. And hey, once again, advice to a young person. I am all for education. Schooling is not always accomplish it. <laughs> not sure how to say that. <laughs> Going to school does not always accomplish education. So you can go through a degree, and you've probably worked with, so you may have worked with some people like that. They went through a degree, and they didn't really seem to learn anything. And it didn't seem to work. It didn't seem to take. And then I've known people who didn't, known people who didn't go through a traditional route towards the job that they're in, who were just hardworking and smart and read and listened and studied and improved themselves along the way. And that education that you get after you get out of the classroom is <laughs> probably more important. Adine. Well, no, God can say that. <laughs> so you didn't build that. He's reflecting, the artist is reflecting God's creative spirit that he put in him. <laughs> and I believe... E equals MC squared. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Now, that may not even be it, yeah. There's always going to be something else, isn't there? I believe that Einstein said, and I hate to misquote people, but I believe that Einstein said something along the lines of, I try to imagine how God would have done it. And when you get to that, that simple, elegant, neat solution, that's how God would have done it. That makes sense. I mean, that makes sense because that looks like something God would have done. <laughs> I don't know. At least he, he, seemed, he seemed to have come from that point of view in a certain way that you know you've gotten to the right answer when everything becomes simple. Yeah. A good thing applied correctly. Sure. And, uh, and so that's kind of like, you know, you know, Einstein was great, he was a great mind because maybe his mind worked better than your mind, but it didn't work anywhere near God's. Yeah, yeah, we're all, we're all fools compared to God. So a thing to remember, we're all pretty much on the same, on the same ground. Uh, just looking at that miraculous catch of fish, I read someone made the, asked the question, did Jesus just, boom, make a school of fish appear in the water in that point? Did he call all of the fish to come to that point? <laughs> Did he just know there were fish there? <laughs> we don't know. It doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of a curious thing to think about, but we don't, we don't know. Uh, again, this, this may not be the same time. There's some things that line up. John talks about Jesus calling them when they were mending their nets. And one commentator asked, are they mending their nets after that catch of fish that started breaking the nets? <laughs> it's possible. You had to go through, you know, you had to work on the nets probably on a regular basis anyway. But if this miracle occurs at the same time, it certainly explains when he says, okay, now it's time to follow me, that they're like, <laughs> Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> uh, we see that now. And he tells Peter in particular to go fish. Uh, 
Peter always seems like the sort of the sort of the, the boss man, you know. <laughs> He's got, you can imagine he was probably the he was probably the leader among this group of fishermen anyway. And there's one of the there's one of the film dramatizations of the life of Christ that has Peter coming in on the boat yelling that they didn't catch anything and tell Matthew he's not getting his taxes this month. <laughs> so just a, a funny characterization of Peter. Probably not a man you would try to tell how to catch fish. It doesn't make any sense, but something interesting that Peter calls Jesus, he calls him master, master, epistate in Greek, uh, the one who stands in front, the one who stands at the head, the chief, the jefe. He's, I mean, more respectful than we might use those terms. Not just rabbi in the way that you would call someone by a, you know, that's your, your courtesy title, but master. He, he recognizes someone of authority. And this doesn't make sense to Peter. Uh, it's his name, Trench, um, old commentator, notes on the miracles of Jesus, pointed out that Peter went out to catch fish and he got caught himself. We don't know how Jesus does this, but this miracle occurs. And it's not just a little miracle. I mean, you know, if I could stand here and just reach under the table and pull out a fish, you'd have to wonder, okay, now how do you... <laughs> That'd be strange. If I stood here and made a fish appear in my hand, that would be a miracle enough if I filled this whole room up with fish. Or even better, if I filled up the counters over there with fried catfish just out of nothing. This is not a small miracle. Jesus doesn't have to do small things. He can, but it's an incredible, an incredible thing. And Peter's already called him master. So I thought that was in there later. Acknowledging that authority. A thing about Peter, too, is even though, does he have doubts about this? Sounds like it. So we fished all night, you know. Has a little bit of doubt, but he has a little bit more faith than he has doubt. <laughs> He's got a little bit more faith. Got enough faith to try. Sometimes, is that all God needs sometimes, is just have a little bit of faith enough to do what I said. And then he's afraid. Well, to start with, Peter, of all people, he knew there wasn't any school of fish there when he was there the last time he was there. He'd just come in. He'd been out there fishing. He knew this wasn't natural. He had plenty of reason. But his response to Jesus, he's afraid, and says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. He's like half right and half wrong about that. He's right on the fact that he's a sinful man. He's wrong about the part that he wants Jesus to depart from him. <laughs> he wants Jesus to stay. He needs Jesus to stay. He just doesn't know how to respond. But like that Psalm 51, broken and contrite heart, Peter knew that he wasn't a good enough man to be in the presence of this. And you know, as long as Peter kept that attitude, he was great. A little bit further on, like when Jesus had to tell him, get behind me, Satan, he was getting a little too big for his britches. He, his humility had receded somewhat. After he betrayed Jesus, well, after he denied Jesus, and then Jesus restores him in John chapter 21 or 22, the last chapter, whichever number that is. That's shameful. When Jesus restores Peter, you see that humble attitude again, right? He says, Lord, you know that I love you. <laughs> you know that I'm sorry. You know that I love you. And as long as Peter has that humility, that's what Jesus needs, is a little bit of faith and that humility and he can take this man who has a lot of great potential and make a, a leader of him. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so, kind of bringing this back to Einstein. So, uh, one, one of the, the quotes that is often attributed to Einstein is uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's as if Peter was cognizant of that way before Einstein. He said, Look, Jesus, we did this over and over and over again. And in essence, it's insane to go try this again. Mm -hmm. 
hat. It didn't take him long to get through that, did it? That's a great comparison there, yeah. Yeah, it's a great comparison, thank you. What do you think he meant when he said, I want you to get away from the shore, I want you to put into the deep. Had he been fishing the shoreline, do you think? Or do you think Jesus was saying, get out of the shadows, get out shallow, get out to where you feel comfortable. I want you to go further out. It's an interesting thought. I don't know what their usual, I don't know what their usual fishing practice was. I don't know enough about how they fished then, you know. It seems I've. So there must have been something, you know, was he, was he fishing somewhere where he felt comfortable? Were they fishing all night into the shallows? And Jesus was saying, look, I want you to go. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. I want you to get out of where you feel right. I want you to go out into the deep water. And I want you to cast it into the deep. And then when he did mm -hmm. what he was told, then we read the rest. It's an interesting it's thought. Fun. It's an interesting thought. There again, I'd have to know more about how they usually fished during those times. Certainly. You're over here doing this. Yeah. Go do this. He's certainly telling them to do something. Certainly telling them to do something that doesn't make sense to them. I just found it interesting that he put the deep. I want you to go out into the deep. It's not like, why wouldn't he just say, go back to where you were and drop it again? Yeah, that's like me. You know, I, I believe I've read it. Or maybe, yeah, he's not a, he's not a, I think that just, I think, I think maybe it's just one of those times Jesus says, do not be afraid, which he says many times. Why is Peter so afraid? Yeah. Peter's, Peter's not afraid of the fish. He's not afraid of the water. He's afraid of what he's seen because it turns everything upside down. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I think it's interesting that we tell our kids. Next time.